Thank you everybody for coming both uh, here and online. This is such a beautiful part of the world. Um, my wife and I really have enjoyed going around and seeing all the beautiful natural things here, um, the castles, the history, and um, we look forward to coming back again. And we're very pleased to have this opportunity uh, today. And so um, our subject today is very challenging. It concerns our environment. And I think uh, a good metaphor is the one used by the American visionary R. Buckminster Fuller. Uh, and he wrote in his 1968 book, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, that we're all astronauts, in which he visualized our planet as a spaceship powered by a finite amount of fuel while traversing space. Today, that fuel supply is being exhausted. Uh, it's threatening life uh, as we know it, not only human life, but all life. The warning lights are flashing and they're flashing very brightly. Um, I want to uh, thank Mike Blythe for introducing me to the Confucius Institute at Bangor University. And also would like to express my thanks to uh, both directors, Lena Davitt and uh, Fiona Fu uh, for inviting me to come and speak in Bangor. More than a half century ago, I took my summer break from Harvard Law School to do volunteer work in the East End of London. And um, I was working with recent immigrants there. And along with two colleagues, we had an epic road trip that touched parts of England and Wales. We came very close to this area and I'm happy to see that it's as beautiful as ever. As part of my journey, we explored the Cotswolds and one of my companions guided us to the town of Sirencester, which as you may know, in Roman times, was only second in population uh, to London itself. And uh, the reason that we went there was to meet an eccentric couple who lived in a house that was mentioned in the famous uh, doomsday book, The Survey of 1086. The husband, Terence, was an expert in evaluating water courses. And the wife, Stuart, was Charles Dickens' great granddaughter. I mention it today because it reminded me of Dickens' famous opening of his 1859 epic novel, The Tale of Two Cities, which summarizes, I think, very well the situation that our world community now faces. Dickens wrote, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. When I last visited here, there were very few voices crying out about where the environment was headed. But like passengers on the sinking Titanic, the world largely just sat there as the band played on. We're clearly at an existential crunch point, my friends. Too bad we didn't start to make the serious changes way back then or in the decades that followed to escape the environmental Armageddon now staring us squarely in the face. It is the best of times and it is the worst of times. But here we are, we can see with our own eyes that things are beyond bad. 
but our worst fears are confirmed by the latest series of periodic reports assessing the science-based aspects of our global environment that are issued by the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. This represents the global scientific community's most recent consensus by thousands of climate scientists and signed off by UN member states that have been issued since 1988. It's no wonder that UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that we're in the process of, quote, sleepwalking to climate catastrophe, unquote. And, the world, and that the world community lacks the political will to achieve the agreed upon uh, goal of the 2015 Paris Agreement to cut greenhouse gas emissions with a view to holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees centigrade uh, over pre-industrial levels and to pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5% uh, above pre-industrial levels. Guterres said that the 1.5 degree goal is on life support and it's in intensive care. Okay, next. Okay, next. Okay, thanks. Okay, you have to push that. The jury has reached the verdict, and it is damning. This report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a litany of broken climate promises. It is a file of shame, cataloging the empty pledges that put us firmly on track towards an unlivable world. We are on a fast track to climate disaster. Major cities underwater, unprecedented heat waves, terrifying storms, widespread water shortages, the extinction of a million species of plants and animals. And this is not fiction or exaggeration. It is what science tells us will result from our current energy policies. We are on a pathway to global warming of more than double the 1.5 degree limit agreed in Paris. Some government and business leaders are saying one thing but doing another. Simply put, they are lying. And the results will be catastrophic. This is a climate emergency. Climate scientists warn that we are already perilously close to tipping points that could lead to cascading and irreversible climate impacts. But high-emitting governments and corporations are not just turning a blind eye. They are adding fuel to the flames. They are choking our planet based on their vested interests and historic investments in fossil fuels, when cheaper, renewable solutions provide green jobs, energy security, and greater price stability. We left COP26 in Glasgow with a naive optimism based on new promises and commitments. But the main problem, the enormous growing emissions gap, was all but ignored. And the science is clear. To keep the 1.5 degree limit agreed in Paris within reach, we need to clap global emissions by 45% this decade. But current climate pledges would mean a 14% increase in emissions. And most major emitters are not taking the steps needed to fulfill even these inadequate promises. Climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals. But the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. So IPCC's most recent reports from three different specialized working groups are gonna be followed by a fourth this October for a presentation at COP27 in Cairo in November. IPCC Working Group One's report issued last August focused on the physical basis of climate change and was specifically focused on atmospheric chemistry and physics. It found that human activities were unequivocally 
responsible for major and unprecedented changes to the climate that were already being observed, and that some of these, like melting polar ice, were fast becoming irreversible. IPCC Working Group 2's report, published this February, dealt with climate uh, crisis impacts. It found that no place on our fragile planet was immune from disastrous, disastrous environmental consequences, including droughts, floods, heat waves, and rising sea levels. Half of the global population is already highly vulnerable. Mass die-offs of species are already underway. Coastal areas face inundation at temperature rises of 1.5% above pre-industrial levels. And key ecosystems are losing their ability to absorb CO2 and other greenhouse gases. Um, morphing from helpful carbon captures to harmful carbon emitters. I can imagine that being situated here in Wales with a government in London that it seems to sometimes only pretend to be pro-environment, that this report must be especially alarming. It must even be more alarming to those who are far away from here in Pakistan, where March temperatures hit record highs, 49 and a half degrees centigrade. IPCC's Working Group 3, uh, published seven weeks ago, enumerated how greenhouse gas emissions could still be reduced to avoid many, but not all, consequences of our collective irresponsible behavior. Interestingly, the COP states sign off for working group three negotiations were the longest on record. And the report had to be delayed from the April 1st target date. And I think maybe that's a good thing because having the sign off of political stakeholders strengthens their buy-in and further legitimates the scientists' conclusions. Another reason the delay is good is it may avoid references to April Fool's Day, which we celebrate on April 1st, to play jokes on unsuspecting friends. But climate change is a deadly, serious matter. It's no joke. Working Group 3 concluded that countries we're not keeping pace with the minimum actions required to reach net zero emissions and maintaining the current trajectory could result in a temperature rise up to the catastrophic three degree level. It found that whole of society changes will be necessary in every aspect of our global economy and societies in order to phase out fossil fuel dependence. Avoiding the worst consequences uh, forecast by working groups one and two, it's still possible in theory, but if and only if governments and all relevant stakeholders take immediate aggressive action, sadly, they're not. One of working group three's more sobering conclusions is that Global emissions must be reduced by 43% by 2030 to limit global warming to the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degrees target that year. Yet countries' current climate pledges fall far short and currently will result in an increase in emissions between now and 2030. The working group experts concluded that we're, we actually need emissions to peak by 2025 without dramatically further strengthening mitigation efforts, we're on track to see an alarming 3.2 degree rise by the end of the century. It's the best of times and the worst of times. 
An exhaustive investigation report in your Guardian newspaper this May 11th found that major global oil and gas companies are planning and implementing dozens of mega projects that threaten the already slim chance to achieve the Paris targets. Um, and if governments succumb to their powerful lobbyists and fail to act, these companies are going to continue to drown in windfall profits as the world crashes and burns. At least the parts of the world that aren't already yet submerged. Their short-term expansion plans alone involve oil and gas projects that are going to produce greenhouse gases equivalent to a full decade of CO2 emissions from China, the world's biggest polluter. These plans include 195 so-called carbon bombs, humongous projects that would each result in at least uh, a billion tons of CO2 emissions over their lifetimes, equivalent to about 18 years of current global CO2 emissions. About 60% of these projects are already started to some extent. It is the best of times and the worst of times. And to throw a further spanner in the works is uh, Putin's war on Ukraine. This one event will certainly upend and complicate Working Group 3's findings as they're based on data collected up to last year. Moreover, the war has given many countries an excuse for slow walking their previous commitments and temporarily gorging themselves on coal, oil, and gas. It's the best of times, the worst of times. Even after conducting a comprehensive multi-expert review process, there's still not 100% consensus. Expert minds can and do differ. For example, some experts believe because relevant data are collected in five-year increments, global greenhouse gases must peak no later than 2025 and not by 2030. However, this is not possible. On the other hand, in a study in the journal Nature, modeling by an international scientific team concluded that if nations fully implemented their most recent climate pledges, we might be able to only keep global warming to the Paris Agreement target of well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. While it isn't under 1.5 uh, degree threshold, below which many experts still feel is necessary, it's far below the extreme warming of three degrees or more that some current models forecast. Absent significant changes, but, and it's a big but, their modeling presumes this will only happen if nations carry out their promises almost immediately to decarbonize their economies, which is far from guaranteed. Your Met Office researchers now say that there's around a 50-50 chance that the world will warm by more than 1.5 degrees in the short time period of the next five years. In a further troubling development, as we're still not even out of danger from the current coronavirus pandemic, scientists are reporting that global warming will contribute to the more possible animal to human transmission of potential pandemics. Because of the serious consequences, the journal Nature decided to take the extraordinary step of posting a pre-publication version of the study. It's the best of times. It's the worst of times. Some experts and environmentalists considered COP26 in Glasgow last fall to be a cop out and a bunch of greenwashing malarkey because so many parties are not doing nearly enough to avoid irreversible climate disaster. But for me, one hopeful sign was that despite being in the midst of a Cold War 2.0, China and the US issued an unexpected joint declaration in Glasgow on quote, 
enhancing climate action in the 2020s, unquote. Why it's so important is that China and the US are the leading greenhouse gas emitters. So their actions are potentially the most consequential. The declaration reaffirms both countries' commitment to tackling climate change through their respective accelerated actions in the critical decade of the 2020s, as well as through cooperation in multilateral processes. It also calls for concrete actions in the 2020s to reduce emissions aimed at keeping the Paris Agreed aligned temperature within reach, including in the areas of methane reduction, decarbonization, and forest protection. Few thought that such cooperation could take place when bilateral relations were in such a serious downward spiral. But they're a testament not only to the two governments, but thanks to the two lead negotiators uh, uh, in representing the two countries, John Kerry for the US and Chinese Special Climate Envoy, uh, Xi Jinping. Their efforts are a rare example of what's potentially possible even in desperate times when the stakes are so high and national interests overlap. You need only remember that the age old scourge of smallpox, which killed more than 300 million people in the 20th century alone, was eradicated at the height of the uh, Cold War and uh, that the two countries got together and were able to, um, were able to work out a system where between the two of them, that they could have an opportunity to uh, end smallpox. And now uh, we're faced with this monkey pop, pox outbreak. And uh, um, we know that the smallpox vaccines seem to moderate that. We don't know how serious that's going to be, but it is something very serious that we have to uh, take in, uh, into account. Um, so that's something we, we have to consider and to uh, uh, look forward to as well. So when the, this declaration represents a promising step forward and offers uh, reassurances about new momentum for sustained and future cooperation, it's short on specifics. And as we all know too well, the devil is always in the details and there's no time for delay. Before getting to China, let's briefly discuss the prospects for environmental change in the US, or as I often call it, the untied states of America. Lately, in a word, the government seems to be dysfunctional. The main reason is that the two parties are really two warring tribes who can't agree on much of anything. Making matters worse, President Biden has a razor thin majority in the House of Representatives and a 50-50 split in the Senate, where uh, in some cases, um, the vice president can uh, overcome uh, the, uh, a tie, but not, uh, but not in all cases. So this is a very serious such situation in my country, and uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to get any better it seems like it's only going to get worse because we have an election coming up. And in that election, uh, it's very likely that the Republicans could uh, take uh, control back of the Senate uh, and the House. And right now we have a situation where one person, one Senator in the Senate, uh, whose name is Joe Manchin from West Virginia, is blocking Biden's $3.5 trillion infrastructure and environment bill. And that senator seems to be only voting in his self-interest to generate more profits for his small energy company at the expense of the US and the world. A principled legislator would do what's right, but Manchin only seems to be looking to enrich himself. And I say that as somebody who considers himself a Democrat. I believe he belongs in a hall of shame. 
together with virtually all Republicans who are creatures of the army of lobbyists unleashed by energy companies and politicians um, who, like uh, Donald Trump, either deny that the planet is on the knife edge of disaster uh, and or who falsely claim that market forces will help ensure necessary changes. I'd like to say, heaven help us. But in truth, heaven only seems to help those who help themselves. Sadly, barring some miracle, Republicans uh, may well control Congress in January. And it's even possible that Trump or a Trump with a brain could be elected president two years later. And if so, the US could again pull out of the Paris Agreement. I think such a move would seal the fate of all of us on Spaceship Earth. It is the best of times and the worst of times. And about China, the situation as usual there can also be summarized by one word, complicated. You've now no doubt heard the word dilemma. Many times you've heard that, but China's situation is so complicated that it has a trilemma, where the country faces a difficult choice among not two, but three important competing energy variables, affordability, environmental sustainability, and supply security. This is a classic case of juggling public policy choices and making the least bad decision. It's like a balloon. If you squeeze it in one place, it'll bulge out in others. And in China, the ruling Communist Party or CPC, uh, for them, order and stability comes first above everything else. And so on September 22nd, 2020, the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, surprised the 75th session of the UN General Assembly by announcing that China's CO2 emissions would peak by 2030 and that China would achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. A year later, she told world leaders that China would uh, cease building coal-fired power plants outside of the PRC after existing projects were completed. Last week, Climate Action Tracker reported that China would reach Xi's goals years ahead of schedule. And so here are some interesting facts and statistics about uh, China and the environment. So global uh, coal consumption by region here. Um, at the forefront of China's energy trilemma is coal. Coal is the globe's most carbon intensive and dirtiest energy source and China is the biggest consumer of coal. Um, and next you can see the reliance of different countries on uh, fossil fuels. So um, China currently depends on fossil fuels to generate more than 80% of its energy. And this compares with less than 70% for uh, EU members. So you can see here that it's China, the US and uh, uh, the EU, along with UK, uh, that have the most to do, and we don't have a long time uh, to do it. And so China is responsible for almost a third of the Earth's carbon emissions. China accounts for more coal emissions than any other country, including number two, U.S., and you can look at this historically as well. China, India, and other developing countries have argued with some justification that their contributions to global warming are modest when looked at historically. And so they asked for some relief. Unfortunately, the consequences are far too severe to cut them any slack. As US President Jimmy Carter once said, life is unfair. Um, and here we can see the increase in CO2 from uh, 1960 uh, to uh, 2020. On the other hand, when it comes uh, to greenhouse gas emissions, developing countries like China and India have caught up quickly to the more developed countries like the US, UK, and member states of the EU. If we're to avoid catastrophe, though, we all have to make 
very uh, painful and expensive consequences. According to Global Energy Monitor, an independent carbon monitoring group, as of the, this January, there are more than 90 gigawatts worth of new coal-fired power plants under construction in China, and about 160 gigawatts of pre-construction coal power projects. China is expected to see continued growth in coal over the short term. As of the beginning of this year, the operating capacity of China's coal power plants was 1,000 gigawatts compared with 227 in the US, 232 in India, and 118 gigawatts in the EU plus UK. Chinese leaders crave stability and social order in what they've long called a harmonious society. So they're generally weary of social unrest. And this year, they're even more so because of COVID, the Ukraine war, and the continuing uncertainty uh, of its economy and the global economy. The CPC leadership is nervous. As a result, they've decided to open the energy spigot in the short term to ensure energy security. China. The daily electrical output from coal has unfortunately set several highs recently. Coal inventories at power plants are being maintained at historically high levels. At least five major coal-fired power plants were approved for construction this year by mid-February, and three billion dollar coal mine projects were also approved in February. But at the same time, the winds of change are literally blowing across China. Over the past decade, China has taken concrete steps to tackle carbon emissions. Its share of electricity produced from renewables has steadily increased from 18% to 29% in the decade since 2010. That's at a pace that beats the US China is on track to generate at least 570 gigawatts of wind and solar power uh, energy between 2021 and 2025, meaning that China's installed capacity for wind and solar power could more than double in just five years, reaching more than 1,100 gigawatts by 2025. Together with China's other plans for clean energy expansion, the new wind and solar power could allow China to peak its fossil fuel consumption and CO2 emissions before 2025. This would put China on track to meet its renewable energy target in 2026, four years earlier than its latest nationally determined um, contribution. Now, also, when you add into the mix uh, that China is doing a lot of green research, China has been smartly moving up the R&D ladder. China is now the global leader in scientific research concerning renewable technologies, and it's produced almost three times as many papers related to energy in 2020 as the U.S. has. Also, China is becoming uh, more powerful in terms of patents. In 2018, China was awarded more than half of the world's patents in renewable energy, and China's lead is expected to continue to increase. This reflects a general trend in China's rising mastery of innovation as confirmed by UN statistics. And another uh, important fact is that China has a big lead in electric vehicle uh, production. So China had decided quite early on to try to create uh, a vibrant uh, market for uh, EVs, and uh, they've been very successful. Also, uh, to try to address the climate uh, situation, China's launched the world's largest carbon trading scheme, and they did that almost a year ago. 
It's an important element to help China hit net zero emissions by 2060. Carbon trading is a market-based method, as you know, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It works by setting an overall emissions limit for certain industries. The government issues permits called credits, allowing holders to emit a certain amount of greenhouse gases over a period of time. In China, the scheme identifies and supports companies that are more energy efficient. It penalizes heavy emitters who are forced to buy carbon credits uh, for more efficient companies. The scheme covers 2,225 power generators that contributed around 40% of national carbon emissions. Seven other industries are expected to be included in the next few years. Emission quotas for the CO2 equivalent volumes are allocated based on the emitters reported volumes in the previous year. Uh, and those are kept in a central registry, registry um, to facilitate trading, settlement, obligations, and payment. Um, experience so far suggests that firms require much more oversight than is currently done. Uh, because many have underreported emissions uh, that can help them avoid or reduce their obligations to buy uh, quotas. And recent reports suggest um, that uh, the government has uh, met some headwinds that they have to address, but they're committed uh, to going forward, but maybe at a slower pace than they originally thought was uh, possible. And there's other technologies in China which are showing significant progress uh, as well. And these include uh, solar and wave energy, as well as energy from clean hydrogen, and also carbon capture, utilization, and storage, or CCUS, and direct air capture of CO2 with storage. New peer reviewed research just released concludes that China has the potential to achieve net zero CO2 emissions by 2060 by both reducing emissions and also at the same time increasing uh, carbon, uh, forest carbon uh, sinks. Okay, so we could probably be here till midnight until Friday discussing all these challenging and promising developments, but I think you get the picture. In any case, it's like the two Chinese characters uh, for danger and opportunity that in the West, we think make up the word for crisis. And crisis, it, indeed it is, but there are opportunities presented at the same time in the midst of the dangers. There's also, pardon the terrible pun, cross-fertilization between China and US. I know nothing about farming. The last time I visited a farm was in the US state of Wisconsin. And the farmer was a friend I met in Beijing. And he was a Trump supporter. So I wasn't really surprised that he seemed intent on raising less corn and more hell. Because in his little farmhouse, he had over a hundred guns uh, including an AR-15 assault rifle. In America, you know, we have this epidemic of guns. We have about 330 million people, but we have close to 400 million guns. And it's an equation that doesn't compute and that is a disaster. So China has abundant supplies of coal, but and the coal interests still possess great political power. So it would be a win-win if an alternative use for coal could be valuable, uh, non-polluting, uh, make coal a non-polluting asset. So I have another friend who's from Indiana. Unfortunately, he's a Trump supporter too, but he may have found the idea uh, to use coal which is a, you know, uh, a carbon uh, and made up of insects uh, that are compressed through millions of years, and to use coal as a fertilizer, um, which uh, at the same time would aid uh, carbon capture. Okay, thank you, Lena. Okay, cool. 
All right. So anyway, I'm not going to run through all of this, but um, he has a methodology where you can take uh, coal, make it soluble, and uh, make it work uh, for uh, the environment. Um, and it, uh, we know now, especially because of what's happening in Ukraine, fertilizer is very, very expensive. Coal is in abundance, and as uh, coal use is being phased out, um, a, a solution like this could could well work. Help me here. Okay, here. Okay, fine. What am I doing wrong? Okay, What's, it's not moving. Okay, fine. Thanks. Um, so, um, so this may be one. Uh, you do it. <laughs> You, so anyway, um, this, is, this is a solution that I think uh, could very much uh, be a potential. And it may not be the solution, but I do think that um, there, uh, this word merits further exploration because there's so much coal that could be used if it could be turned into a positive and not a negative. Um, it would be really uh, uh, quite something. Okay, thanks. But so, how did how did China pull off all these changes, and uh, how does China work? And we we hear a lot of good bad things about China, and I've lived in China for most of this century. Um, so, to me, the reason China works is that they have a goal-oriented discipline of five-year plans. Um, and it's one element of China's continuing economic miracle. It's also a means to guide China to help contain global warming. And the other is the, the Chinese system promotes uh, officials based on their performance in government and state-owned enterprises. Unlike many other places, there's no Peter principle in China where managers are promoted beyond their competence level. And that's why a person like Donald Trump would never have a chance in China because someone like him would never be appointed village dog catcher. And if he were, he'd be fast removed for being corrupt. I was taught that five-year plans were communist window dressing that forced the people to swallow the whims of one person's will. They're not. They're a multi-year collaborative effort uh, that now include getting online input from Chinese uh, netizens in which government officials, academic experts, and other stakeholders discuss and debate China's near and longer term future. Um, and it, it really, they successfully help to guide the country's development. They're a target setting management tool against which progress is measured in real time. And you don't have to believe me, because I'm a little bit biased based on my experience, but it's just, you just have to look at public opinion polls in China, because in poll after poll, even despite COVID, Chinese citizens consistently rate their governments at all levels exceedingly highly. A long-term study last year examined relationship between Chinese citizens and the CPC from 2003 to 2016. The study found a near universal rise in average satisfaction toward uh, all four levels of government in China. That's township, county, province, and uh, central. During this period, based on 31,000 interviews in uh, both urban and rural areas. Uh, this survey is very comprehensive. In 2016, the last year the survey was conducted, 93.1% of the respondents were either relatively satisfied or highly satisfied with the top level central government's performance, representing an increase of 7% from 2003. In the same period, township governments, the lowest level examined, received the approval of 44% of respondents in 2003, 
but that jumped to 70% in 2016, a 26% rise. Fake news, too good to be true. Communist propaganda, well, consider the source. Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. It's the longest academic study of Chinese public opinion ever conducted by a research institution based outside of China. And according to Harvard, it used the most uh, objective and quantitative uh, methods available. Further confirmation is provided by the two decade long global poll called Edelman Trust Barometer or ETB. Conducted by the respected Chicago-based Edelman Communications, it measures citizens' trust in their own country's institutions. Um, and uh, in 2022 uh, ETB, Edelman asked respondents in 27 countries uh, to indicate how much they trusted their own uh, country's NGOs, business, government, and media and trusted them to do what's right. China scored highest at 83%, up 11% from 2021. The US scored 43%, down 5% year on year, and a 10% drop from 2017, which happened to be Trump's first year in office. In fact, the overall 40 point trust level divergence between the two uh, important countries have never been greater. And here in the UK, the UK dropped 1% only, and only one place to 44%, but it's now 1% ahead of the US. My faith is not only in the Chinese government, but it also extends to China's private sector, which is increasingly like that in your and my country in terms of CSR, corporate social responsibility, or as we now call it, uh, ESG, environmental, social, and governance, in a nod to the critical importance of including green issues in every aspect of commerce. In China, one of the greenest companies that I followed was one that nearly everybody knows now, not only for its proven leadership in 5G mobile technology, but also for being targeted by the US government with uh, unproven allegations of so-called backdoors supposedly allowing Chinese government to intercept communications using their equipment. As far as I can tell, there's no proof whatsoever of this specious allegation, but I'm no expert. But your famed MI5 is an expert. And they could find no evidence of backdoors after a thorough investigation. But what is proven is Huawei's front door leadership in ESG. Huawei has gone all into helping the information and communications technology or ICT sector to achieve carbon neutrality. Huawei has committed to making its products 2.7 times more energy efficient. It pioneered a unified carbon emissions indicator system for their ICT sector as a tool for reducing carbon emissions, while at the same time supporting increased data throughput. They call it more bits, less watts. Huawei has also introduced its green development solution to help mobile operators reduce their carbon footprints. In addition, Huawei launched its award-winning PowerStar solution to help its uh, mobile phone operator customers meet their energy saving goals without compromising performance and user experience. It's estimated that Huawei's PowerStar solution is going to decrease CO2 emissions by 43 million tons, uh, thereby saving 55 billion kilowatt, uh, kilowatts of electricity by 2025. And that's the environmental equivalent of 380 million newly planted trees. Um, now, to me, this is the opposite of greenwashing blah, 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 that too many companies are doing globally. Many are all talk and little or no action. 
deeds speak louder than words, or even that slick, empty marketing, marketing campaigns for that matter. In 2020, CDP, a global environmental nonprofit organization, scored more than 5,800 company efforts combating climate change. Huawei was one of the few to receive an A for reducing carbon emissions and climate risk, while at the same time growing a low carbon economy. Huawei is not alone among Chinese companies either. According to CDP, in the China region, 37 companies are setting climate targets through their science-based target initiative, an initiative collaboration between CDP, UN, and several NGOs. Among them, 13 companies have submitted their targets and four have committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2050. 11 companies have even committed to 100% renewable electricity. But don't take my word for it. Um, when this blasted COVID is done and finished, go to China and see for yourself. It is the best of times and uh, the worst of times. Now, I keep asking myself, why so late in the game that the world still isn't taking climate change as an existential threat? Shakespeare offers us a clue in Julius Caesar where Cassius says, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. In other words, it's human nature. And maybe the American cartoonist, Walt Kelly, had it exactly right. In the poster, he designed for the first Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970. We have met the enemy and he is us. And maybe this video, whose conclusion jumps right out at you, explains it best of all. And sorry, we couldn't figure out how to get rid of the commercials at the beginning. So just bear with us a second. Hola, Papa. I'm calling you to say <laughs> I've sent you a little mug. Because bye, -bye. I... Two frogs are minding their own business in the swamp when, wham, they're kidnapped. They come to in a kitchen, captives of a menacing chef. He boils up a pot of water and lobs one of the frogs in, but it's having none of this. The second its toes hit the scalding water, it jumps right out the window. The chef refills the pot, but this time he doesn't turn on the heat. He plops the second frog in, and this frog's okay with that. The chef turns the heat on very low, and the temperature of the water slowly rises, so slowly that the frog doesn't notice. In fact, it basks in the balmy water. Only when the surface begins to bubble does the frog realize it's toast. What's funny about this parable is that it's not scientifically true for frogs. In reality, a frog will detect slowly heating water and leap to safety. Humans, on the other hand, are a different story. We're perfectly happy to sit in the pot and slowly turn up the heat, all the while insisting it isn't our hand on the dial, arguing about whether we can trust thermometers and questioning, even if they're right, does it matter? It does. Since 1850, global average temperatures have risen by one degree Celsius. That may not sound like a lot, but it is. Why? One degree is an average. Many places have already gotten much warmer than that. Some places in the Arctic have already warmed four degrees. If global average temperatures increase one more degree, the coldest nights in the Arctic might get 10 degrees warmer. The warmest days in Mumbai might get five degrees hotter. So how did we get here? Almost everything that makes modern life possible relies on fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, full of carbon from ancient organic matter. When we burn fossil fuels, we release carbon dioxide that builds up in our atmosphere, where it remains for hundreds or even thousands of years, letting heat in but not out. 
the heat comes from sunlight, which passes through the atmosphere to Earth, where it gets absorbed and warms everything up. Warm objects emit infrared radiation, which should pass back out into space, because most atmospheric gases don't absorb it. But greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane, do absorb infrared wavelengths. So when we add more of those gases to the atmosphere, less heat makes it back out to space, and our planet warms up. If we keep emitting greenhouse gases at our current pace, scientists predict temperatures will rise four degrees from their pre-industrial levels by 2100. They've identified 1.5 degrees of warming, global averages half a degree warmer than today's, as a threshold beyond which the negative impacts of climate change will become increasingly severe. To keep from crossing that threshold, we need to get our greenhouse gas emissions down to zero as fast as possible. Or rather, we have to get emissions down to what's called net zero, meaning we may still be putting some greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, but we take out as much as we put in. This doesn't mean we can just keep emitting and sequester all that carbon. We couldn't keep up with our emissions through natural methods and technological solutions would be prohibitively expensive and require huge amounts of permanent storage. Instead, while we switch from coal, oil, and natural gas to clean energy and fuels, which will take time, we can mitigate the damage by removing carbon from the atmosphere. Jumping out of the proverbial pot isn't an option but we can do something the frogs can't. Reach over and turn down the heat. Can you guess one surprising puzzle we need to solve to run our planet on renewable energy? Discover the answer with this video or subscribe to our channel. Okay. Um, so if I can leave you with a parting thought, please, in the words of uh, Welsh poet Dylan Thomas, do not go gentle into that good night, but make your own unique contributions to containing global warming and preventing an environmental holocaust that many of us older, but perhaps not wiser folks have dumped into your laps. So uh, we've created a fine mess for you, especially you younger people. And uh, I hope uh, that you can solve it and that we who've created this can somehow help you do it. Thank you very much.